Lovely. So hello, uh, my name is Erin. I use she, her pronouns, and I am beaming onto the internet today from uh, a Miskawachi Waskaigan, uh, known as Beaver Hills House or Edmonton. This is the ancestral land of the Pappas Chase Cree and is today Treaty 6 and Métis territory. Um, thank you to the organizers and fellow panelists. Today I will be speaking about my research into implications of white women's reactions to the Karen trope, which has exploded in popular culture, especially over the last few months. The popularity of the term Karen as applied to a white woman who uses her positionality and privilege to harm BIPOC folks in her interactions with them is credited to Black culture and specifically Black Twitter. Writing about the moniker, Karen Atia says, notions about the name and white privilege have been circulating in the Black community for a long time. Activist Alicia Sanchez Gill writes, Karen is more typically used by Black women and working class women to talk about the way wealthy and often white women enact classism and racism. Now that Karen has made the jump to mass media, several social media posts and op-eds in recent months have attempted to recenter the impact of the term as misogynistic or ageist against Karens. <clears throat> For example, anti-trans writer Julie Bindel tweeted in April, does anyone else think the Karen slur is woman-hating and based on class prejudice? And a poll tweeted by the account Friends of Journalism went viral the same month for asking if the term Karen is being used as the sexist and racist slur equivalent to the N-word for white women. The implication that Karen signifies something misogynist, ageist, or even racist against white people negates the original use of the word. It is important here to center the original intention and power of the term as a shorthand for the actions of white women in upholding white supremacy. In her introduction to the 1915 uh, reissue of uh, Ron Ware's Beyond the Pale, uh, Mickey Kendall writes, whoops, sorry, uh, in order for solidarity between white women and women of color to develop on a broader basis, um, the history of the former's failure to support women of color confronting problems like racial inequality and immigration must be addressed um, and examined so that these issues can cease to be replicated in each successive generation. The complicity of white women in upholding white supremacy is well documented. From early colonialism to suffrage, like Emily Carr and Nellie McClung here, to today, terms like Karen arise out of a need to signify a common and violent behavior. So why has Karen become so ubiquitous now? I'm interested in exploring how the popularity of the Karen trope is an indicator of white folks discovery, viscerally through mass and social media, the violence and harm experienced by people of color who encounter a Karen. The name resonated on black Twitter because it's a recognition of experience and builds solidarity. So has the new popularity of the trope inspired a collective reckoning among white women, or is it an easy out to express disapproval of a Karen on social media, but not engage in meaningful change? And I'm sorry for saying the word Karen a million times during this presentation. In our always on media landscape, reactions and think pieces abound as soon as something new trends. In the last few months, outlets like The Guardian and Los Angeles Times have published articles by white women redirecting us to consider the misogyny of the trope. This pivots from legitimate calls of racism to a reactionary claim of sexism, a familiar pattern in white feminism. Many pieces published in mass media, <coughs> sorry, about the Karen trope acknowledge the history of the term in black culture and lay out all the evidence that Karening is an act of complicity in white supremacy. Of course, a few of these pieces are written by black women, like this piece from Karen Atia. However, none of the dozens of articles that I analyzed included a now what of, or personal accounts of reckoning with privilege. Social media offers us a more personal reaction to the conversations about Karen. My analysis here is ongoing, so I would be grateful for any suggestions, comments, or questions. <clears throat> These posts from the Atlantic Time and Vox share articles describing the Karen phenomenon. These are broad issue articles, not coverage of any one particular example. I chose Facebook because it requires more accurate self-representation than Twitter, and I wanted to code as often as possible information about each post's author, uh, each comment's author. Um, in total, I have analyzed and coded more than 1,500 comments. Uh, the comment section on Facebook is difficult to properly export and to use AI text analysis tools sometimes misses the subtleties of internet references and also there are a lot of GIFs or GIFs. Um, my analysis revealed some evidence of personal reflection like this exchange. 
I chose this screen grab to show because it's representative of posts I found on the three comment threads uh, with an original poster sharing that they appreciate the reminder to reflect on their behavior and others chiming in to agree. But I chose this one because I love that there's a very grumpy actual Karen chiming in at the end. Um, Actual Karens commented in significant numbers on the articles with a few happily resigned to their fate to the name of uh, to in the name of calling out bad behavior, um, but most were grumpy or worse about it. Um, but aside from a few indications of personal reflection from Karens or otherwise, the majority of the posts are a combination of tagging friends, making comments based on personal experiences, and registering complaints about the name Karen, PC culture, or pop culture in general. In both mass media and social media engagement with the Karen trope, there is little evidence to suggest that this vilification with a nickname is useful in prompting white people to reflect on their privilege or their own behavior that may be similar to a Karen in the news. In communities that experience this type of, this type of racial violence as a part of life under white supremacy, Karen is a useful shorthand, an inside joke, but it does not have the same effect among Karen's white peers. Writing in the Washington Post in 2018, writer Antonia Nuro Farzan posted, posited that nicknames like Karen are too cutesy to properly represent the violence of their behavior. She says, their memorable nicknames easily lend themselves to hashtags, memes, headlines, and ridicule. But whether the viral monikers are a productive way of calling attention to the experiences of Black Americans is a matter of debate. We de to be human is to categorize. We develop shorthands for common types of people, but the intense recent focus on vilifying Karens has painted a complex and critical issue, that of white women's complicity in uh, white supremacy as an easily dismissed bad apple, maintaining white folks' ignorance about the heavy unlearning they need to undertake. I'd like to now share a quote from writer Dion Brand, writing recently in the Toronto Star. <clears throat> I know, as many do, that I've been living a pandemic all my life. It is structural rather than viral. It is the global state of emergency of anti-Blackness. What the COVID-19 pandemic has done is expose even further the endoskeleton of the world. I have felt tremendous irritation at the innocence of those people, mostly white, finally up against their historic and present culpability in a set of dreadful politics and dreadful economics, ecocidal and genocidal. Their innocence is politically, economically, and psychically lucrative. One avenue for assessing the popularity of the Karen meme is through the field of agnotology, the study of manufactured ignorance. It asks questions like what don't we know, why don't we know it, and what keeps ignorance alive or allows it to be used as a political instrument. Studies in agnotology have addressed intentional misinformation campaigns around global climate change, female orgasm, environmental den denialism, race, and much more. The focus on Karen in white controlled mass media is functioning to keep ignorance alive with respect to white folks complicity in systemic racism. This may seem counterintuitive. Isn't the Karen trope bringing attention to the issue of interpersonal racist violence? My analysis of mass and social media found reactions to the trope of white women distancing themselves from Karen, showing little evidence of true self reflection and growth related to anti oppression. As a final thought, I offer this from Nancy Tuana and Shannon Sullivan. Ignorance is a phenomenon that is often overlooked in traditional epistemological scholarship. Often assumed to be a simple lack of knowledge, a systemic study of ignorance is typically seen as irrelevant to epistemological concerns. They urge feminists to study ignorance far more attentively, for practices of ignorance are often intertwined with practices of oppression and exclusion. The power of digital media magnifies ignorance. Online worlds beyond our control give us endless excuses to validate our not knowing and double down on our prejudice. The hyper focus on individuals caught on camera lets other white women off the hook. There is much more to explore here and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. <laughs>